And this morning, we want to devote a little time to this very interesting book, Chariots of the Gods, by Eric von Danken. The book is unquestionably highly stimulating. And there are a great many interesting points made. And I think there are several phases of von Danken's work which deserve our consideration. And in the light of that, we want to study it at least briefly. The whole premise indicates to his mind uh, that at some remote period, spacecraft reached the Earth, found it populated by comparatively primitive people, and in various ways and by various means, gave the impetus to work humanity, which led to what we might term historic progress. Now, as he himself points out, this is basically an hypothesis. And he gathers as much information as he can to support the point of view which he is seeking to establish. He approaches his subject in good scholastic order. But I think we should also bear in mind that there are alternative explanations for a number of the facts which he gives us and for many of the hypotheses which he creates. The first point that it seems to me is troublesome in connection with his book is that actually he is approaching his subject primarily on a scientific level. His entire concept implies that life, not only on this planet, but perhaps on many others, is an unfoldment of physical technologies of various kinds. He assumes that there are physical explanations for most of the mysteries which confront us today, particularly those involving anthropology. Now we have a number of interesting, corroborating uh, details. And of course in this brief time we can't explore them except in generality. But what he does point out, first of all, that is most stimulating, is what I have called, in my writings, the dark curtain of history. In other words, we can go back eight, six, eight, maybe ten thousand years of history and reasonable proto-history. And then we come to a comparatively unexplored time pattern. Everything seems to vanish into an unknown. We have very little link between primary life unfoldment on the planet and the rapid rise of a so-called intellectual humanity. And he spreads out for us some of the evidence of a powerful intellectual factor working behind this dark curtain. On one side, we have the Neanderthal and the Pithecanthropus erectus. On the other side, we have Egyptian culture, Chinese culture, Indic culture, and the ancient civilizations of the Western Hemisphere. All of these emerge from a mythological background. 
and practically all of our history prior to eight or ten thousand years ago may be regarded as mythological. We are confronted with a mass of legendary which would seem to indicate that the earliest reflectors in the terms of mental reflection were already at loss for tangible and uh, obvious fact. We also realize that one of the reasons for this dark curtain is the lack of a written method of communication. Most primitive peoples depended entirely upon oral tradition, and this tradition was largely in the keeping of a priestly group of, uh, we might say, verbal historians. They perpetuated the ancestral law much as it is still perpetuated among such groups as the North American Indians. Uh, the emergence, therefore, of a series of extraordinary monuments which seem to have been standing long before the emergence of, a, of an organized human society, uh, this is the primary point upon which the author builds his case. Actually, the evidence of historical antiquity is great. Uh, the uh, evidence of intervention from other planets or other solar systems is not as strong. It becomes with him a necessity of explanation. He feels that without some intervention from a source of knowledge higher than that of humanity, the present condition of the world cannot be explained. Now, it happens, fortunately or unfortunately, that it has been my privilege to visit a great many of the sites described by von Denken and to visit others, which he does not mention, where legends of numerous types have been perpetuated for thousands of years. Legends are very interesting things, and may well be the history of prehistoric times. But legends also quickly submerge themselves in inscrutability, and the modern searcher after facts, going backward toward the origin of things, falls almost immediately upon the psychological effect of mystery on the human mind. Now, you do not have to go back uh, to the other side of the dark curtain of history to see what legend does to people, and how the human mind, groping for answers, sometimes presents solutions that are more difficult than the questions. A good example of this, of course, can come down to two episodes within historic period. One is the Wall of China. We have the wall itself dated. The inscriptions upon it indicate the time that it was built. The Chinese annals describe the circumstances of the building in the perpetuation of their written records. We know without any reasonable doubt that we are dealing with a structure erected approximately 2,000 years ago. This is well within our historic framework. Yet we are confronted, confronted at the same time with one of the most stupendous engineering projects existing on earth today. Uh, an engineering project which we cannot 
legitimately assumed to be due to miraculous factors of any kind. Yet for even many of the Chinese today, there is no explanation for the Great Wall. I know that when I was there, that even my guide, who spoke a great deal of English and was a fairly well-educated man, stated flatly that human beings could not have built the Great Wall. Here was a tremendous achievement, nearly 50 feet high, 20 feet, 25 feet thick, and 2,500 miles long. And yet this, which is equal to any monument from remote antiquity, is known to have been built by man. How it was built is still a little mysterious, naturally, although we know that the answer lies in a tremendous amassing of manpower. We also know that from the inscriptions relating to the wall on some of its faces, that the builders were resolved to create a wall around China, approximately one-tenth of the circumference of the earth, and they did so. Now this seems to indicate that we are dealing with a mystery within the range of history. Another interesting and remarkable pattern arose in Central America at the time of the arrival of Cortes on the coast of New Spain. Cortes found the city of Mexico an extraordinary mystery. The people of the area found Cortes an equally impossible mystery. The records of the time indicate that Cortes arrived on birds. We know that the people saw his ships. When he landed with horses, the native records say that these horses were centaurs that the men grew on the horse. This is only four or five hundred years ago. We know to the very fall of the empire of Central America, the most de desperate factor contributing to the utter demoralization of the people was the fact that Cortez was superhuman. He arrived, it is said by some accounts, out of the sea like a fish, his body covered with scales. The scales, no doubt, armor. Yet here in Central America, we had a people who invented the world's finest calendar, so fine that the early Spaniards corrected their own calendar from it. We know that they were also a literate people. And with the exception of the Mayas, who had a written language, they used principally pictoglyphs. These pictoglyphs were extraordinarily inaccurate. They represented a fusion of superstition and visual experience. The uh, Spaniards were beyond comprehension. And of course we know the old story that the Spaniards first fell on their knees and then on the Aborigines and that was the end of a civilization. Now, these are not isolated incidents. Uh, if we wish to consider the possibility that the gods came from space, we must also face the Navajo and Hopi and Zuni creation myths in our own southwest that states they state directly that the gods came out of the earth and that mankind itself rose out of the earth on the stalks of plants that the deluge of Noah was under the earth. Now this may, sub may also be subject to considerable controversy. And today the average person is not inclined to agree with these myths. Yet among these people, the myths were not only their most 
reasonable solution to a mystery, but were accepted beyond doubt as physical, factual circumstances. So all over the world we have extraordinary beliefs based upon evidence that could not reasonably be explained. In Central America, modern thinkers have created an entire Toltec culture, mostly on an hypothesis, to explain the unexplainable in connection with their researches and explorations. The orientations of the Mexican monuments have been a cause of almost as much controversy as the orientation of the Great Pyramid of Giza. And yet, can we deny uh, that the Central American people, capable of one of the finest calendars that we know, and a chronology that is more accurate and more useful and usable than our own, might also have known something about orientation. We have to question a little bit, therefore, to what degree it is necessary to assume outside intervention. Another point that I think is, uh, well, uh, conceivable at least in, in, our, in our time, is that all of these monuments do point to one thing. Somebody was smarter than we believe. Now, in our way of thinking today, practically all of anthropology is under scientific domination. Even a man who writes a book like this, with all the hypotheses rather strongly advanced, is going to have trouble converting traditional-minded anthropologists. They have their own mythology, and in many cases it is little better. Let us assume that von Däniken has given us a series of facts relating to achievements of somebody long before the period that we consider to be the beginning of science. This attitude is not unique. You don't have to go back thousands of years for it. I read an article a few years ago by a prominent think thinker, medical thinker, who stated that prior to the 18th century A.D., all so-called knowledge was ignorance and superstition. Having satisfied himself upon this point, the author then explained that in the last 100 and 150 years, through the blessings of science, all progress has been accomplished. This I would regard as mythological. <laughs> so we'll start with von Däniken's first important uh, observation. Long ago, somebody knew something. Now there are several explanations possible for this circumstance. One is that we are completely wrong in our present approach to anthropology. That instead of the uh, modern viewpoint, which has been at work for uh, at least a hundred years, trying to make everything modern and to wipe away practically everything that is not modern, uh, we uh, can approach several points with interest. I remember when I was down in San Juan Tarcon, outside of Mexico City, the, the Mexican anthropologist who went with me to the Great Pyramids of the Sun and Moon rather smilingly observed, your American archaeologists think the pyramids were built a thousand years ago, the Germans will give it 2,000 years, and our anthropologists in the field will give it four to 5,000 years. So uh, if we wish to assume that the human mind lacked the capacity 
to accomplish any prodigious undertaking until recent times, then, of course, we run right into the hypothesis presented in the chariots of the gods. If man had no mental ability at an older date than we realize, then intervention from somewhere must have occurred. But are we correct in our assumption that there never was a highly developed culture upon this planet? As against this hypothesis, we can present the hypotheses of Solon and Plato. And uh, these particular points seem to have been generally ignored by Van Danken. These hypotheses, as represented in the records of the Egyptians, which were secured by Solon while he was in Egypt, and from Solon descended as a heritage to Plato. There was a more advanced civilization on this planet than anyone has suspected. Then you can say, if so, why do we not have greater proof of it? And it, one way of looking at it, in gathering his information for space travel, von Duncan actually provides us with physical proof that something was happening here before the dawn of our modern scientific conviction. Plato very firmly and quietly states that about 12,000 years before the Trojan War, the last part of the great Atlantean or Posidian Empire sank beneath the ocean and vanished away. He describes in detail the magnificence of that civilization as it was perpetuated for him through the Egyptians. And the Egyptian civilization goes back almost halfway across the interval necessary to arrive at these conclusions, and the Egyptians showed Solon ancient records at Sais, going back further than the time of the Atlantean deluge. Now, much depends, therefore, upon whether or not we can find some reason to suspect uh, that there might have been a great culture on our own planet. Legendary is as firm in this direction as it is in the direction that von Danton wants to advance. Everywhere, practically, among the peoples of the earth, the Atlantean deluge is recorded in some form. It has been fairly clearly indicated in the records of Central America, and the researches of Thompson and several others, including Willard, resulted in the discovery of pictorial material showing the destruction of the Atlantean Empire. If Plato is correct, the Atlantean people were a highly civilized order. Uh, they had a country uh, that already was building palaces, shrines, and temples. They had a mercantile encircling the entire earth they had highest known developments in arts and crafts. And according to many older accounts, they were in possession of scientific knowledge, which they abused, and for the abuse of which they were destroyed by the gods. Now, we can say there isn't very much evidence for the Atlantean civilization. But perhaps these various mysteries which we are having trouble in explaining stem from this very point and constitute the evidence. In, in one way, it would be worth considering 
the mythologies, for example, concerning the descent of the gods, presumably from space. I'll, I'd like to give some attention to in a few minutes, but at this point, we will use a reference which he himself makes use of, and that is the um, Central American legend of Kukulkan, or Quetzalcoatl. According to the Indian records, and the codices are still in existence, the forebears of these people came from seven islands, and some of the early manuscripts, we have a facsimile of one of them in the library, indicate a migration of peoples, and the seven islands correspond exactly with uh, Plato's description of the Atlantides. Kukulkan, according to these people, did not come down from the sky, but came on or out of the sea. On the other side of the earth, Oanese, the fishman, came out of the sea. About this, the legends are very definite. He came out of the water, not out of the sky. When Quetzalcoatl died, it is said that his soul was picked up and taken to Venus. It does not affirm that his body was. Now, other legends of similar value all add up to the possibility of a great sea migration. The Seminole Indians of Florida are convinced that their forebears came from a country lying to the eastward. And the uh, old maps of Europe medieval maps, many of them show the Atlantic continent. There is a very good example of this in uh, the writings of the great Jesuit father, Athanasius Kirkland. So we have, if Plato is correct, a highly developed civilization that flourished over a period of several hundreds of thousands of years. And finally, was submerged by a whole series of natural disasters. These natural disasters are recorded. Also, there is in the Platonic theory, supported by legendary and lore, much to indicate that these people had highly developed scientific equipment that they were not a primitive group. They were not merely dressed in feathers and wild animal skins. They were a people of classical attainments. And due perhaps to the tremendous scientific achievements of these people, Lord Bacon uh, was impelled to suggest but the rise of science and art and literature, mathematics and architecture in our modern time could well represent the new Atlantis, which was to be established on the Western Hemisphere. So we do have a legend that is just as valid, I think, as almost any other legend that we wish to uh, appeal to, which would imply almost certainly that we cannot affirm with certainty that there were no civilized peoples on earth prior to eight or ten thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era. Now our difficulty is also somewhat circumscribed by a circumstance that has perhaps been one of the major uh, difficulties we have faced. And that is the sudden submergence of the Atlantean Empire, which according to the Central American records, took 60 million people to death in 24 hours. If such a catastrophe actually occurred on the other side of the dark curtain of history, and most of the area where the civilization existed is now 
on, the, uh, on one of the Atlantic Ocean Basin shelves near the Azores. It is quite probable that the great central culture was destroyed. This would be in a harmony with the uh, account, at least in legend, given in the Platonic discussion. Namely, that the gods destroyed the audacity of these people who were attempting to overthrow and overwhelm the gods with their own intellectual skills. There's a little bit of a parallel to some problems that are arising with us today, which may give cause for a moment's pause. Now, if it is conceivable that we did have a great civilization in our own planetary sphere, uh, then what are the supporting evidences that such a civilization could exist? Probably one of them, lie, one of the supporting causes lies, or supporting explanations, lies in the old Indic records, the Hindu records which our author also calls upon. According to at least some of these records, we are informed definitely that this planet has shaken countless civilizations from its surface. Now this uh, might require a reorientation as to the source of so-called progress or science on earth. That this science did exist here, and existed here further back uh, than the hypothesis advanced in the chariot of chariots of the gods. Now the point that he makes, which I think is interesting, of course, is that practically all Indic records and the Hindus of antiquity were probably among the best recorders that we have of ancient matter. Strangely enough, they seem to have had the type of mind that was capable of exploring rational possibilities and exploring them with the greatest mathematical certainty. It was, for instance, possible for them to calculate, and they did calculate, the cycles in the past in which all seven planets were in conjunction in the same sign of the zodiac, and that these conjunctions were millions of years apart, and they calculated them. So we are in some position to assume they had a reasonable degree of knowledge. Now, in Indian mythology, uh, the gods certainly are believed to have come from elsewhere. This there is no uh, reason to doubt. That they did come, possibly from the sun. But the ancients, the Hindus, did not assume that these deities came in spaceships. They assumed that the earth planet received its life impulse on a much higher level than matter. That this impulse came in the form of consciousness moving on rays of light. And that this consciousness moving on rays of light reached the earth probably several hundred million or more, perhaps a billion years ago. And that these beings coming as uh, Transphysical beings on energy waves established uh, the first abode of beings on what we now call the polar cap. This was the eternal island, the source of all life on earth, and corresponds to the mysterious sign of the cross, which Plato declared was the symbol of the creative logos. And this is still repeated in the fission of the uh, germinated cell. 
For the first division of a cell establishes a cross at its north pole. To the ancient Orientals, therefore, the origin of life on this planet and on all other planets was a spiritual procedure, not a physical one. And of course, as a metaphysical procedure, is particularly abhorrent to the modern scientist. He wants no part of it. And yet, we are in no way capable at the present time of explaining the great processes of life unless we go back into the causes of things, into the intangible realities at the base of life. It is exactly the same thing as it is in the birth of the human being. Man evolves from a cell, and the mystery of his coming forth into adult human existence is greater, perhaps, than any mystery relating to the origin and development of humanity on earth. Something happens inside, not on the outside. The human soul does not arrive in the bo- to the body in a spaceship. It is part of a great, invisible, intangible process going on behind the physical structure of life. And until somebody becomes more aware of this other process, the process which has to be regarded as transphysical, we are not going to come very close to the answer of the problem of man's own place today in the world in which he lives. We cannot explain man mechanistically. We are always going to end with a dark curtain. We are going to find that the origin of human consciousness cannot be explained by assuming that it came from somewhere else because then we fall into Aristotle's progressive regressions. We fall into the fact that if it came from somewhere else, then it had to be somewhere else. If it was somewhere else, how did it get there? So we keep on going back. If If it came from our sun, where did it come from before that? From some other sun, from a cosmic sun, from a universal galaxy. We keep pushing the problem back, but we are pushing it back physically. And yet all physical things are suspended from invisible things. And the causes of all forms of phenomena are still locked in a world of causes which we not only have not been able to explore, but because of our own limitations are inclined to deny. If we once admit that there is more to man than body, then we are not in a position to require that all explanations to the phenomena of life must be physical. If we go back also further and further into the history of mankind, we realize that there was a vast evolutionary process prior to the emergence of physical man. Science will admit this and has an inclination to assume that their ultimate origin, so far as the earth is concerned, was water. That all things came out of moisture. Also, it has been shown with some validity uh, by uh, space uh, balloon research in years past, the spores of life are to be found at a great distance above the earth that these spores of life drifting downward probably resulted in the establishment of the primitive protozoa from which most of our living organisms are said to have descended. So we can go on back and back and back and we'll find somewhere along the line that even this hypothesis fades away. But it does provide us with the realization that forms and bodies were being built Now, these forms and bodies uh, are included in general in our friend von Duncan's uh, work. But he assumes that these forms and bodies were in 
capable of developing into the rational organisms that we know. We might also then ask, what about the condition of the embryo or the fetus at an early stage of its growth? When it resembles nothing so much as a highly glorified polywad, where is this intelligence? Does this have to be contributed from an outside physical source? Why not admit that along the way of man's own evolutionary process, there is a time when infancy of itself outgrows itself? and that from the infant comes the child, the child who suddenly has the prodigious capacity to learn the additional, uh, the addition tables and other basic mathematical principles, that the child gradually unfolds into the adolescent, not because something is added, but because something emerges, something that was there all the time and had to be locked in the original cell. It would be quite inevitably impossible to assume that the, when the acorn uh, begins to grow, that there is a time when somebody else has to bring a tree for it to grow through. The tree is in the acorn. The entire history of humanity is locked within the human seed. <coughs> and in the course of time, this passes through stages. And we cannot necessarily distinguish these stages exactly. We cannot say when they are going to move into some other degree of development. The development comes from within them. Now, if we go back away from materialism for a moment and study some other hypotheses that have been developed in the course of time, and also back again to the scriptural writings, which our friend uh, finds useful to him in some parts of his book, we are told in the very old times that the magnetic field of the earth was the abode of the beings who were later to become human. We find this mentioned or discussed in principle at least by the San Corniathon in his Phoenician history. At some time, the human embryo is quickened. And the quickening is either the entry into the body of a life principle or the emergence through the body of a life principle. But that principle is its own. It is not contributed from some distant, remote source. The only contribution that we have been able to more or less biologically sustain is heredity, and even this is weak. Let us then suggest this point that was made by most ancient religious peoples, namely that the entities that were to be in soul and were to be embodied existed without body for a remote in a remote time for a vast period. And that this unembodied state did not necessarily mean an unintelligent one. That an entity without a body cannot function here is obvious. But that an entity without a body cannot function in its own climate or condition, in its pre-embodied state, is not so certain. If it is certain <coughs> that an entity cannot function without a body, or cannot exist without one, then our all hope, our hope of immortality is lost. The ancients were of the opinion that at certain times in the development of early physical peoples, uh, vast prehistoric orders of life were swept away as being unsuitable for ensoulment. That gradually, through the refinement of body, Entities which had been hovering over and forming these bodies entered into them. That the entities themselves fashioned these bodies from their own essences. And through physical existence, these bodies were gradually brought into physical manifestations. 
when they reached a certain degree of refinement, the entities entered into them. We have no way of knowing whether all entities entered at the same time. The chances are they did not. There have always been and always will be various degrees or levels of bodies. The prehistoric world vanished away. And in order to create instruments for greater intelligence, it was necessary for the dinosaur and the magatherium to fade from our experience. We also have on this earth at the present time an infinite variety of bodies through which an infinite de a variety of consciousness is manifested. And we have no way of knowing that any body can exist without some measure of consciousness locked within it. And we are not at all sure that man in his pride has a greater share in consciousness than a flower or an insect. The body is different. The body is more or less adjusted to the physical environment. The less the adjustment is, the less the manifested intelligence will be. But in the course of ages, consciousness, which existed prior to body, moved in upon it, just as it does in the actual uh, ensoulment of the embryo. This tremendous process was the basis of Brahmanic theology and Brahmanic anthropology and psychology. It was assumed by these people that the unfolding of body was not identical with the unfolding of consciousness, but that consciousness and souling body was the cause of its unfoldment. Evolution is not an unfoldment perpetually of form. Evolution is the release of consciousness through form, in which consciousness is building ever more noble mansions for its soul. Now, if this is a hypothesis of the ancients, and it was just as much as any other that has been advanced, there seems to be, in our present time, considerable support for this point of view. We know, for example, that every generation has produced a few uh, extraordinary human beings. We know that the great discoveries of science and the great achievements of art and literature have always been possible only to a small part of mankind but that this information passed on has become the property of many and has gradually resulted in the unfoldment of our own culture. There seems to be, therefore, much to support the idea uh, that the entire process of growth on our planet and, for that matter, on any other ha inhabitable planet is a process of form-building moved by a causal agent, consciousness itself, which is creating itself the forms which it will inhabit. And that in this consciousness is potentially locked all knowledge, all skill, all proficiency. If this can be at least partly sustained, then we have to face the fact that at certain periods in the prehistoric development of the planet, we had these cycles of infancy, childhood, adolescence, and maturity. That these cycles were manifested physically by the abilities and debilities of surviving species or those for which we have at least fossilized remains. The old Hindus also took the point of view that bodies themselves were exuded from a superphysical structure, the etheric region, that forms were first etheric, and that gradually uh, they were made more and more physical as the soft body of the snail exudes its own hard shell. Therefore, that bodies were in various degrees of condition, 
long before they ever reached the state that we know at the present time. That these bodies also pass through their embryonic stages seem quite reasonable. And that at one time in the past, as Ankoniathon points out, the whole planet was uh, filled with incredible, indescribable monstrosities, forms that were experimental, forms that represented consciousness groping after a type of instrument which would enable it to function in the material world. If this earth had a different uh, core of vibration, a different degree of density, or had an entirely different climatic situation, then consciousness moving into form would produce appropriate forms. Some of the older Hindus were convinced that many so-called uninhabited planets will be found in which are inhabited, but the beings are invisible to our limited sensory perception because they represent different levels of vibratory energy. If we want to think about it in this way, we could understand why, over a period of vast time, forms could exist that were not physically tangible enough uh, to leave fossilized remains or to leave any clear physical indication of themselves. These forms might even have been adapted originally to a planet still partly molten in which life as we know it today could not possibly exist. These forms may have floated in like smoke. They could have been gradually built downward until finally uh, the emergence of a basic type of physical structure, somewhat according to the hypothesis of modern anthropology. Therefore, anthropology could pick up where the mysteries of the universe uh, brought forms close enough to be considered anthropologically. But the uh, question it seems that we should face sometime, and must face, is that we are dealing primarily with consciousness. It does not make any difference whether this consciousness, theoretically, is on the sun and could build a, sl a spaceship and come here, or whether this consciousness was here all the time as part of the innate structure of a planet, and that consciousness may have had as its first collective vehicle the magnetic core of the Earth itself. But we are dealing uh, primarily with a phenomenon of consciousness, and consciousness does not require any physical instrument uh, to carry it from one part of the universe to the other. It only requires an instrument if it is going to project a form in some part of the universe. And apparently it did project with great difficulty and considerable experimentation the form that we know at the present time. If we can therefore accept the idea that consciousness can, containing within it both intelligence and energy was subject to various releases on this planet. For we, are, we have something to work with, for we are also concerned not only with the possibility of some power coming uh, to animate uh, human form, we must also explain the presence of many non-human forms. We have to wonder about animals, which have also evolved. We must wonder about all forms of minerals and other growths in rocks. We have to form the entire concept of birds and insects and fishes. All of these things have also gradually evolved their forms. And perhaps there is no, hu no human society that it is perfectly integrated as the society of the bee. There is definite indication of intelligence there. The uh, most natural answer, it seems to me, to the whole problem is that consciousness itself is the architect. And that this architect is concerned continuously 
with the construction of forms suitable for its own manifestation. That this consciousness is substantially invisible. That it is also the object of universal veneration among all ancient and civilized peoples. And that it is virtually impossible to construct a, a plausible hypothesis to explain the complete phenomena of life without reference to religious principles. Because religion finally becomes man's groping after the mystery of original cause. An original cause is not mechanistic. Original cause is not a machine perpetuating itself. A machine giving birth to other machines like itself and so to infinity. Consciousness is forever the architect of forms. And as men like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo realized, the manifestations of consciousness in the lower forms of life are often more complete than in human life. The Pythagoreans began the establishment of the geometry of plant growth and all kinds of evidences of a superior intelligence within the form itself. Now it seems that at this time when we are confronted with innumerable questions and problems that we can go throughout all of our society and find almost identically the same dilemma. Modern man is still, in a sense, incapable of explaining himself. And uh, there are a lot of people, even in this time, that think that a highly developed race from somewhere else arriving in a spaceship might solve our problems for us. And that what we really need is someone who really, who really knows who is going to show it all to us. Uh, this seems to me, however, to be contrary to the primary purpose of existence itself. Uh, all of the struggle that has gone on in the historic period of man's existence was a struggle towards something. It was a struggle that is motivated by the dim outlines of an evolutionary process. We do not fully understand all of the aspects of this evolutionary procedure, but we are convinced that we are confronted with a problem of growth, unfold. We realize the gradual refinement of organic quality, which makes possible the revelation of greater intelligence from within the creature. We are constantly ideating toward the unfoldment of faculties. We are working now with the idea of an extrasensory perception band. We are working more and more to understand the inner life of man. Within the last 20 years, there's been a tremendous upsurge of seeking, and this seeking has never really been satisfied with the idea of the mere perpetuation of a mechanistic program or procedure. We are beginning, for instance, to realize that civilization is not an entity in itself. It has to be ensouled by purpose, that the survival of a culture is not by polishing the machine as frequently as possible, but by releasing more consciousness into that culture. And this consciousness comes from the enlightened persons who rise within the culture and take upon themselves the labor of advancing the common cause. Everywhere today we are beginning to recognize the need for a tremendous ensoulment of something. Now, we have all kinds of explanations of why this ensoulment could happen. There are people that believe that at this time our ensoulment is due to intervention from somewhere else. That perhaps in some mysterious way, waves of constructive energy are flowing into us from space. Uh, this, it seems, however, is a, a statement of our own weakness. It is the assumption that we can't do it. And that because through the last several thousands of years we've had a rather rocky time, that nothing better can be achieved without some intervention. Actually, the reason we've had rocky time is perfectly obvious. 
We were not wise enough to solve our own problems. Now, we may not be wise enough to solve all of them for some time, but consider the extraordinary transformation in thinking that has occurred within ten years, where suddenly it seems that circumstances and conditions have forced upon us a further introversion into ourselves in the search of solutions. If at some remote time, some people was confronted with an issue which for them was as difficult or inscrutable as our present problem of pollution, that something happened. Uh, the Mexican archaeologists are quite sure that the entire change in Central American civilization was due to natural causes, that a situation became impossible and brought to the, a certain level of culture to an end. And this, in turn, immediately required a new culture. The culture that was imposed upon Central America, for instance, by Spain, was not an enduring culture. It led to more problems than it solved, because this uh, culture was artificial. It was like a blood transfusion that did not take, and left the patient worse off than he was before or a blood transfusion in which the blood itself was not pure and brought more disease with it. What we are therefore primarily concerned with is that circumstances force changes in patterns. They also force a great many changes demanding the revelation of internal content. When a great emergency arises, man solves it. It is when there are no emergencies that he falls apart. As long as he can live without thinking, he will. When he has to think, he will. So it is a problem of the inevitable needs of circumstances and conditions. Let us then suppose that several thousand, maybe 50,000 years ago, the, the Atlantean Empire, rose to the highest proficiency of any people on earth at that time, although others were growing up, and it was impossible to assume that any natural organism is static. They all grow unless the environment becomes impossible and then they fade away. They also fade away when the purpose for which they were created is no longer valid. But let us assume then that at some remote time we did have at least two reasonably advanced cultures on earth. The earliest of these was the culture of the Great Pacific Basin, which is now referred to as Gondwana Land. Here was a culture that reached a high degree of monolithic construction and a culture that probably indirectly inspired the great monolithic remains in nearly all parts of the world. Remember, these periods were not little spots. They were diffusion or distribution of land-water area. This has been pointed out recently in the study of the shift of continents, which is taking interest for many people. Uh, the other great center was the Posidonian center, which was still more highly evolved, and had passed from the monument building stage and the massive um, stoneware, stonework to a civilization much better equipped. The civilization which made use of fire, made use of many other elements that, uh, which were discovered gradually to create the environment capable of supporting a more advanced people. Then let us imagine what, that Plato is correct, uh, that from this great Atlantean center, the city of the Golden Gates, with its walls of oricalcum, a city the walls of which were composed of artificial metals, metals, that this city sent its mercantile to all parts of the world. Mercantiles go only for one purpose, and that is barter and exchange. 
Later, if the exchange is good, they go again for conquest. But in the beginning, uh, like the Chaldeans who traded along the coast of Europe, and up as far as Greenland and Iceland and over to the Western Hemisphere in search of tin, these uh, Poseidonian merchantmen went forth to different parts of the world to explore colonizing potentials. Their problem was almost identical with that which arose with the age of navigation in Europe. Navigation began when the Ottoman Empire closed the Silk Road and made it necessary to reach Asia by water. This was behind the whole move. They weren't out to discover new continents. They were out to make a safe trade route for merchants. And this process led to a vast colonizing situation which continued from the 1500s to the 20th century when most of the colonial empires fell apart. During the process of colonization, it is evident that peoples of a comparatively high degree of cultural attainment would visit areas still in a very primitive degree. We can see the same thing happening today in New Guinea and other uh, forlorn areas of the Earth's surface. These merchants traded. They brought things. They may very well have been accompanied, as most uh, mercantile uh, expeditions were, by scientists, by thoughtful persons interested in the land, trying to understand more about the world around them. And very likely also, it was an opportunity for the distribution of missionary endeavors. And various religious persons accompanied these expeditions. We have the same thing happening on our own Atlantic seaboard in the 16th and early 17th centuries. These people coming to comparatively primitive folks, bringing to them the ordinary commodities of a more advanced culture, could well explain a great many things. For instance, Oannes or Dagon coming out of the Chaldean Sea is attributed by the ancient Chaldean uh, record in cuneiform with the skill to bring to these people certain things. One was a written language. The next was the knowledge of architecture and of agriculture. Then the knowledge of healing. And finally, institutions of government. And to climax it all, a grand overshadowing religious re revelation. These uh, merchants brought the merchandise of commerce with them. They brought uh, the advances and advantages of their own culture and civilization. There is no reason to doubt that perhaps they took some of the more intelligent natives back with them and let them see the magnificent empire of the Golden Gate. Well, these various merchants, spreading out over the face of the earth, could be represented by a man like Quetzalcoatl, who came robed in cloth and gold, his robe covered with crosses, leading uh, Lord Kingsbury to the suspicion that maybe he was a Christian at the beginning of the Christian era. The Nestorians, after all, reached China in the 3rd and 4th century. Why is it not possible that they could have gone elsewhere? In fact, they are beginning to show up now. Their records are showing up in Japan and Korea. We also know the Chinese reached the west coast of the United States over 2,000 years ago. So much earlier than this, missionaries, merchants, travelers from a great central culture could very easily have reached practically every part of the earth, except perhaps the very remote areas of Gondwana land, which was still developing its great the monolithic and Stone Age monuments. They might even have gotten there, some indication of the show. With these people came also the knowledge of how to accomplish uh, heavy labor uh, efficiently and simply. We know that the people of Central America, in our lifetime, have shown that without any instrument such as we have at the present time, they could move 20-ton rocks comfortably and easily. 
simply by a knowledge of leverage and by the use of what might be termed innate common sense. One presented with a problem solved it very neatly, a problem we could not have solved because we were too far from it. And when asked how he did it, he replied, well, I did it that way because that's the only way it could be done. Now, these people have innate intelligence, tremendous innate intelligence, which, if stimulated, will produce various consequences. So, having sowed the seeds, having wakened these uh, surrounding colonial possessions, awakened them with the understanding of arts and sciences, these merchants took their barter and exchange and went their way. And they returned many times, no doubt, to continue contact with these people, and always left behind them the record that someday they would return. They would return. Then came the beginning of the great Atlantean catastrophes, which extended over 400,000 years, and finally ended with the destruction of the last of the last Oposidonian island. Obviously, these people, therefore, the merchants, would never come back. Suddenly, there was a whole circumference of indoctrinated peoples and no center. Suddenly, these different groups were left to their own resources. Yet they were different people than they would have been had they not been visited. They did not have to be visited from outer space, if Plato is correct in his Atlantean hypothesis. And he seems to have developed it with extraordinary skill from ancient records. All is necessary, then, to explain why widely diversified peoples seemingly received a tremendous cultural impulse is to realize that there was a central power to give it to them. And that when this power met disaster, the vestiges of the great central achievement was lost, and nothing remained but the circumference achievements, which were small. Yet each one of these circumference achievements was a seed, and these various nations developed these seeds according to their own abilities and concepts. In recent years, for example, research has been made in the study of languages, and it is gradually emerging as a grave probability that all known existing languages are derived from one source, that somewhere there was a common denominator of them all, which may explain how it is that Laplongeon discovered in Yucatan hundreds of hieroglyphics exactly the same as those in Egypt. Now, these did not have to be brought over by aeroplane. They were brought over by the migrations of peoples. And we can find these migrations, for instance, in the great swastika migration, which went around the world. Also in the migrations of various other uh, implements, such as the bow and arrow, and Cretan pottery designs, and things of this nature. They should show an ancient common mingling ground of peoples. Now, after these um, central inspirers did not come back, a problem of mythology and legendary set in. Obviously, gradually, the originals, the merchants, the missionaries, even the soldiers who came from this mysterious source center, were transformed into supernatural beings. Now, this process of transforming them into supernatural beings actually did not touch theology, although it is supposed to have. These people always interpreted these strangers in terms of their own native religions. Whatever they believed, the mysterious happenings were fitted into uh, that belief. And as these peoples had their own indigenous interpretations, somewhat influenced by longitude and latitude, 
those in different regions unfolded their social and cultural interpretations of the original impulse, each according to his own fancy, his own needs, his own understanding, and the different degrees of previous civilization attained. As we go on with this, we can therefore see why perhaps a dozen different major beliefs could all have sprung from one source and were actually uh, brought into focus by a prevailing internal consciousness concerning life. Primitive peoples worshipped their ancestors, they worshipped spirits, they worshipped ghosts. And in the course of time, the strangers from other lands became ancestors, spirits, and ghosts, part of their indigenous belief. But they also brought with them facts for which these people were deeply and continually grateful, and which for which they offered sacrifice and perpetuated the memories of these remote heroes. From this basis, we can see the gradual coming into pattern of a whole series of purposes. Purposes which uh, we can perhaps dimly grasp. And as this took place over a very long period of time, uh, there is no reason to doubt that most of the records that can be discovered at the present time would be within this general period. Now then, one of the interesting byproducts that comes from some of this thinking is a legend, at least, that is pretty well established, that the Atlanteans did possess means of travel, which were perhaps even more important than ships. There is no reason to doubt that they did possess a power of controlling energy. It was for one of, this was one of the reasons for which they were destroyed, because of their abuse of this. There is a constant recurring belief, at least, that the Atlanteans, at the height of their culture, did have uh, some type of airplane. That they had some kind of uh, means of transportation, such as that which will be found in the story of the Dweller on Two Planets by uh, Philos the Theban that these people did have flying chariots, that they had advanced sufficiently in science to find a universal motive agent, which, were, which has later been called Vril. If this is true, then practically anything that might be even remotely associated with spacecraft could also have originated among these people. Now, for example, uh, our author here describes very extensive landing fields which are supposed to have been developed in South America, in which spacecrafts of some kind could have landed. Well, this, it seems to me, is one of the problems that is not too satisfactorily explained in his own book, because uh, when finally we made a moon landing, uh, we did not use any type of spacecraft that required two or three miles of landing field. It wasn't necessary. And also, before we got there, how could we build the landing field? Now, uh, to get that one answered requires a very involved group of hypotheses. But if these spaceships, so-called, actually were some type of machine invented and perfected on our own planet, then it is quite possible that merchants, the travelers, could have taught the natives how to land a landing, or prepare a landing field, and that planes from various parts of the Atlantean Empire could land, and that these planes would be of the same purpose that we would have, to facilitate trade, to facilitate contact between peoples, and, if necessary, to quell uprisings or difficulties that might arise. There is no real proof that the ancient civilizations of our own planet could not have developed means of travel, and that these means of travel 
up to the present time have always been involved with human beings. In other words, uh, when we find in the Ramayana, for example, references to chariots, we also find earthly emperors, princes, and priests riding in them. We also find that almost every account that has to do with these things concerns some historical incident in the lives of the people. And there has been no record of any kind in, in the literature of, of Asia that these uh, mysterious vehicles were used by other than their own heroes, their own peoples, and their own sages and, and philosophers. As, for example, the famous magic carpet of the Arabian Nights and things of this nature. It is conceivable, therefore, that these various accounts do relate to situations on earth. In fact, the entire idea of the of face travel could still be almost completely linked with the with the sea and ships, because at that time in the Central American area, uh, when Cortez landed, his boats were called birds, and another place the uh, the, uh, the Viking ships with their prows of dragons were called sea monsters. These things are part of the inevitable development of human imagination. Now let's go to the other end of our problem and see what we have uh, to think about, assuming, if we wish to, the hypothesis that space travel from other planets uh, did reach the Earth. This has been part of our great problem with the flying saucers and uh, has intrigued a great many rather serious-minded people. Uh, I talked to one man not long ago about the problem, and he said he finally came to the conclusion uh, that there was something uh, behind all of this, but that it was quite possible that this something did not come from outer space, but that it did represent the, the stratification of the Earth's own structure. We have much more here on Earth than we've ever we dreamed of. The earth is a strange and wonderful place. And in addition to the civilizations and cultures that we can see, we know, as Socrates said in one of his discourses, that he had seen in vision men dwelling along the shores of the air as mortals dwell along the shores of the sea. The interpenetration of orders of life is quite possible. It is also intimated in the story of the Count de Gabalais and the ancient legends of the elementals, the Nibelungen people, and other things of this nature, that there are other orders of life within our own planetary structure, particularly in the so-called empty air. We are beginning to think that the air is not empty at all, and that there is no reason to doubt that whole evolutionary processes are taking place within the metaphysical body of the earth. It is also possible, as was reported in ancient times, that occasionally invisibles do emerge and mingle with visibles, and that what we might consider to be space travel might definitely be uh, a, a proof or evidence of a different dimensional part of our own planet impinging itself upon us occasionally for some reason, actual or incidental. That actually, therefore, there are enough different forms of life that we've never heard of and never seen within the elemental structure of the planet to account for all forms of incredible and unbelievable circumstances. We also know that in centuries past, the whole science of theurgy, or the invocation of spirits, demonology, the creation or invocation of monsters, was bound to the concept that there were invisible orders of life here. Misunderstanding them, we could well transform them into demons. For we know, for instance, that all practically every religion of the world has made demons out of the gods of its enemies. This we have done as long, along with all others. 
This situation then could represent another dimension. Why do we bring these points out rather than ju jumping right in and uh, accepting the idea uh, of the uh, of the space uh, chariots? I think the reason we are inclined to do this, uh, there are two reasons. The first is that in the long run, the acceptance of the idea of the gods appearing as simply uh, super scientists in their ships arriving on the earth actually causes more questions than it will answer. It presents us with a situation which becomes less and less demonstrable as we go along. It brings us into a pattern which is almost beyond our conception. It presents us with innumerable difficulties and is it as a circumstance has no actual physical evidence to support it. The only evidence is the seeming necessity for it. But uh, in all the civilizations we have contacted or all the monuments we have found, there is not one vestige of anything that was actually certainly brought from anywhere else. There is only this, in, this influx or infusion of culture. And it seems quite conceivable that this infusion could result from natural causes here. We do not deny the possibility of space travel. We do not deny the possibility that at some time we will reach other planets. But at the moment and under the existing conditions, it seems to be the hard way of answering the problem. And it still leaves us actually with the uh, the natural question concerning man's own constitution. Again, in somewhat in favor of the space idea, uh, is, of course, the constant references to deities that come from above or from the sky. This, however, as we go back further into this prehistoric pattern, we should find more and more clearly defined. But we do not. As fur the further back we go in theology, the less theology as we know it, we find. The earliest forms of religion that we know of on earth were the worships of taboos and ancestors and the spirits of the dead. It was very late in man's evolution that he con that he really integrated the concept of a supreme deity or any group of supreme deities. This is late. In fact, even the early Greeks didn't have it. And most of the gods and godlings of these people were associated directly with their own cultures. They held them as Spirits to be propitiated. A great man died. His body was preserved. His relics were kept. And he became an ancestral guardian, like the totems. Uh, a mysterious sickness came upon the tribe. This sickness was traced to a taboo, and some poor unfortunate individual was punished for it. Uh, a great hero arose among them. He was regarded with great esteem. When he died, he became a tribal god. But all these people, Shinto is a good example of it. These people trace their religion back to the nat native circumstances of their own lives. The very earliest records of religion we have on earth do not show any divine intercession. They show merely the gradual dawning of man's veneration factor, a faculty of admiring, venerating, perpetuating that which he regarded as important. And heroes rose largely to be perpetuated and remembered. And the pharaohs inscribed their names upon ancient monuments so that their works could never be forgotten. But it was all within a very, very tight picture. There is no clear indication in very early times uh, that these people believed in 
the arrival or appearance of beings entirely apart from their own traditions, or so different as to uh, as to lead to uh, a deification of something different from themselves. All ancient peoples deified their own virtues. They honored their own ways. They kept their own traditions. And their wise men told the stories of their own people. Uh, we do not find any clear indication that would require uh, the idea of something from elsewhere. About all you would need to sustain the general picture would be the concept of merchants traveling and things of this nature, and this would be comparatively late. It would be long after the people had actually integrated their own basic beliefs. So these uh, characters were added to the beliefs, but did not supersede them. I would rather like to assume, for uh, one reason or another, because I think utility comes in. Today especially, we are in need of ideas of help. With ideas that get, and ideals that give us ways of accomplishing things that we need to do. I would like to think, therefore, that what we are really dealing with is the unfolding of human consciousness itself. That all the things that we think of as spaceships and all this type of thing are dimensions of our own consciousness. We have created the concept because it is in there. And someday, if we create the concept, we will build the ship. But all these things emerge from within the unfolding potential of mankind. And at various episodes in history, just as in the various degrees of human life, there are awakenings of, of sudden consciousness. There are moves forward in which suddenly a whole race or a whole empire changes its procedure, changes its points of view. One of the great changers of things, of course, has been religion. The effect of Christianity upon civilization in the last 2,000 years is incredible. And nothing that existed before has remained unchanged. So things arise within the emergencies and needs of people that explain the sudden shifts of history. The Lemurians and Atlanteans were well able to build any monolithic monument that we know today. And the peoples themselves had the one factor that we can't really comprehend today, and that is an incredible amount of labor potential and an infinite amount of time. Buildings were not built in generations even. Even the great cathedrals of Europe were a thousand years in the building. Under such conditions, races, generations moved by tremendous spiritual convictions or by some deep and wonderful ingenuity within themselves, can set themselves to tasks that appear to be inconceivable. It only requires incentive. And incentive is nearly always self-expression. Incentive is an emergency arising within the individual which he must meet by creating from himself the solutions to his own problems. This does not mean that space travel is not possible, but it seems as though, as far as we can see, we have not yet found any answer uh, to our problem that could not conceivably arise within the structure of our own creation, within the tremendous mystery of man as a total being, a being with infinite potential. A, a man, a being growing up in space. And nearly all religions emphasize this, including the earliest. That in the great system of things, all things emerge through man. And the final thing to emerge, the ultimate thing, is the perfect consciousness of God. And as long as this tremendous consciousness must lie behind spaceships or anything else to make them possible, there is no reason why, if spaceships could be developed elsewhere, that the unfolding consciousness of man cannot produce them here if he wants them. In fact, we are working in our own way. We are going as far as we can go physically, and will continue to proceed 
But the time will come when man will discover that his own faculties, his own consciousness, his own inner resources will take the place of practically every mechanical device that he depends on today. These are crutches. They are temporary forms. But everything necessary for the perfect function of man is locked within him, just as everything necessary to his happiness, to his health, uh, to his well-being is available to him from inner resource if he wishes to use it. And it seems to me that the story of evolution is the story of the unfoldment of inner resource. And that in this level, that the entire problem is explainable and at the same time highly inspirational, inasmuch that it reminds us that all things are possible both in the invisible and the visible to those who gradually unfold their potentials and come into the full maturity of themselves as enlightened beings. I think this is the point that we will ultimately have to come to, regardless of the various pauses we make along the way. Man has within himself the solution to himself. He is immortal. He can destroy his cultures, but he cannot destroy himself. He can delay his growth, but he cannot prevent it. And in the end of all things, problems of pollution, overpopulation, and all these will fade away when man out of himself meets the full need of himself and finds that he has extrasensory perceptions, faculties, and powers that will give him everything that he needs for an intelligent, conscious growth right here. And that with these powers gradually unfolding, we have a very brilliant future, even though at some times we grow a little pessimistic. Well, our time is up, so that's all we can do this morning.